Today we're hosting Ryan Enos, who is a professor of government at Harvard uh, and a faculty associate at uh, IQSS, Harvard's Institute of Quantitative Social Science. Um, his research uses a mix of laboratory experiments and field experiments and natural experiments and large-scale observational data analysis to study racial and uh, partisan spatial segregation and its effects on intergroup attitudes and political behavior. Um, his book from 2017, The Space Between Us, looks at the effect of racial segregation on political attitudes all over the world. And today he's gonna to talk about more recent research on partisan segregation that was recently published in uh, Nature Human Behavior and was covered by the New York Times and some other major media outlets. Um, so without further ado, Ryan Enos, uh, happy to have you. Great, thanks. it's great to be here. Thanks for that introduction, Aaron. Let me um, go ahead and share my screen. And I'll assume people can see that. Um, I should say by, um, by, by way of introduction here that as Aaron mentioned, I'm gonna talk about something that um, has recently been published and got some media coverage. So people may be familiar with it, but what I'm hoping we can do is if you, um, if, if you don't read Nature Human Behavior in New York Times or spend your time on Twitter, it might be entirely new to you. Um, and even if you do cover, if you read the New York Times, you'll um, be able to go into a lot more detail here and hopefully we'll have a chance to um, talk about it and, and get some coverage into details that wasn't there. And of course, this is an ongoing project. I'll, when I get to the end, I'll show you some stuff that wasn't included in the original paper. And we just have a lot to do here. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say about it and to learn what your criticisms and your suggestions are. Um, I will, I'll be happy to take questions throughout the talk. I, as I was telling Aaron, even though I've been teaching on Zoom for over a year now, I'm terrible at monitoring these things as I actually talk. So hopefully he can, um, he can help me keep track of things there and I'll, I'll appreciate any questions that people have. So um, the, what I'm gonna be showing you is joint work with Jacob Brown, who's a, uh, who's a, um, a political, uh, sorry, is a, um, who is a PhD candidate in political science in my, in my department. Um, the thrust of what we're doing is examining this question of segregation and partisanship. And just to give you as a way of background, what I wanna assert here is that the segregation of social groups, no matter what the social groups are, is a phenomenon of great sociopolitical consequence. And of course, we recognize through a lot of work in political science that partisanship is increasingly recognized as something that seems to be a consequential social identity. And so what we do is we put those two things together to explore partisan segregation in the United States. And what I'll show you in particular in this talk is I'll show you how we go about doing that. We measure the individual partisan segregation for every registered voter in the United States. And it allows us to explore some interesting geographic variation on that. And what it allows us to do is I think to our knowledge, we're the first people to have these indices of partisan segregation for the United States and actually implement something that people have tried to do for a lot of different groups um, for across the world, where we use these spatially weighted measures of segregation. And what I'll show you here at the end of the talk is something we started to work on, which is after we calculate these, looking at how they change over time and then trying to explore what might be causing the segregation we observe and what are some of the implications of the segregation we observe. So I'll try to make sure I leave enough time to get to that. So I'll go through some things rather quickly, but if you have any questions, of course, just please feel free to feel free to interrupt as I, as I mentioned. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure I can advance my slides. And there we go. Okay, so we're gonna do this by taking advantage of the actual spatial location of every voter in the United States, which is what we see there. And we're gonna take each one of those voters and we measure their hyper-local partisan bubble. We construct the exact potential residential exposure to other partisans of their thousand near, using their thousand nearest neighbors. And what that allows us to do is we think we capture the amount of interaction a person is likely to have with cross partisans in, in their everyday life. So, what we're doing from this, I think, is measure, taking the, our measure of partisan segregation a lot further than it has been historically. Of course, we're all familiar with these red and blue maps like this one from 2020. And then, of course, in the last couple of election cycles, this data has gone a lot better and we see county level variation within, the, within these states. And we know that that tells us some things we can't get from the state level. 
What we do is we take this even further and we use individuals. This is one of these maps that the New York Times made when they covered our work a couple of weeks ago. And we can see, for example, if we zoomed into the LA metropolitan area here, down to the sub-county level, we would notice that there's even a lot of variation that we would miss if we just looked at the county level. So if you're familiar with Los Angeles, that bright blue spot in the center there is the LA basin, which is a heavily non-white part of Los Angeles, and it's overwhelmingly democratic. But of course, if you move further east or further south, you would notice that a person's exposure to Republicans, if they're a Democrat, will get a lot larger, or if they're Republican, their exposure to Democrats will get a lot smaller. And so we can see, just looking at it visually, that this sub-county variation is going to matter a lot. And we can capture that. In fact, we can go down to any arbitrary level of resolution. For example, here we made a map of average exposure in these small grid cells looking at Manhattan and then zooming into the Upper East Side and showing how a Democrat's exposure to Republicans would change. Um, moving across space. And so if you, if you, if you um, stared and really hard at this map on the right, zoomed in on the Upper East Side, you'll see, for example, that moving northeast away from the park, that a Democrat's exposure to Republicans would start to change and they would have fewer and fewer Republicans in their immediate residential environment. So we can capture that kind of variation using the data we have at hand and how we processed it. So just um, briefly, since I know a lot of people are here to talk about the data, I would just want to talk about why we think this is important and why this sort of exposure to our partisans um, matters and why we went through all this trouble to do it. So there's, of course, institutional re reasons, which is that when partisans are all packed together or when they're not, it changes how campaigns might talk to each other. And we all know, because there's a lot of concerns with things like gerrymandered, gerrymandering, that this can be that these homogenous electoral districts that can be gerrymandered might serve to narrow constituencies and change the way politicians behave. I'm on to re often interested in behavioral outcomes myself, and there's a host of behavioral reasons that we might worry about this as well. Sometimes we refer to these positive or neutral or negative sort of effects of isolation or exposure. One is just very classically, we think there's reasons that when you are exposed to people of a different group, that that changes your opinion about them. And one thing that's interesting about, say, about partisanship compared to other things like race that we've often used to measure things like intergroup contact is partisanship can, of course, actually change. And we have some evidence that Jacob has done showing that it appears that when you're exposed to enough people of a different partisan group, you might change your partisanship to match theirs. And he has pretty compelling evidence for that. Um, we even have we have evidence that you when you have more people around you from another party, you're exposed to more of their messages over time. You can see that in survey data, and it looks like even if you're not talking to them directly, there's other evidence from other groups that sort of this casual contact, just seeing people out in your daily environment, changes your opinion about them. Um, we have other evidence um, from from um, randomized experiments that these sort of low level cues people get from their environment, for example, yard signs, for example, can affect political behavior and you might, might imagine those would be affected by who's around you. And of course, we have on the opposite side of the coin, we know that isolation matters too, that when people have um, are segregated from other groups, they can often as a result of that segregation. Um, form extremely negative attitudes about that group. And perhaps some of these very extreme regional differences we've seen in the United States when it comes to things like partisanship might be a result of that sort of partisan segregation. So we think there's good reasons to explore this. And I'm happy to discuss more about some of the work we're doing trying to look at the effects of this later. So what do we mean by segregation? This is what we're gonna be relying on here. Um, sociologists have often uh, talked about segregation as the extent to which individuals of different groups occupy or experience different social environments. And they divide this into two dimensions. They can talk about a dimension of exposure and a dimension of clustering. We're, we're gonna be dealing with this dimension of clustering, uh, or sorry, exposure today. When I'm doing this, I'm, I'm uh, pointing to my computer screen and I realize you can't see that. So I'll try to make sure I'm, I'm describing what I'm doing here. But we wanna measure, spa uh, we want to measure spatial exposure, which is a horizontal axis on this graph I'm showing you here, which refers to the extent that members of one group encounter members of another group, um, or the reverse of that, which is spatial isolation when they're experiencing members of their, of their own group in their local spatial environment. So that's what we're trying to measure is exposure to people from another group in your local spatial environment, which is this dimension of segregation. Often the way this has been measured, in fact, exclusively pretty much the way this has been measured in the past has been aspatially. So we don't know the exact location of individuals. And so in practice, segregation is almost always measured using these real units. Like for example, taking a census tract, measuring how many people are in a census tract, then summarizing those across a larger environment like a city. And so for example, also you'll take a group of people, a group of 
you'll take people in group Y and imagine they have, let's say, infinite interactions across the census tract, what percent of those would be with group X? And the opposite of that would be isolation. What percent would be with group Y? And then they average, average those census tracts across the city. That's that a spatial measure. Now there's a lot of problems with this that I'll talk about in a second, but to give you an intuitive sense of what this might look like, this is Chicago that I'm showing you here and the darker areas are, um, are colored by percent African-American in the census tract. And so Chicago, which is this famously segregated city by race, has a level of black white exposure of 0.2, meaning your average white person would expect about 20% of their interactions in their local environment to be with African Americans. And the isolation for blacks is 65%, 0.65, so about 65% of the interactions that your average black person has with in their local environment would be with other black people. Now, people have long pointed out problems with these types of measures. So one is just using these geographic units. These uh, real units can it can um, obscure a lot of a lot of geographic a lot of subunit variation. So, for example, census tract, which is most often used to measure these things when it comes to measures like race, can have uh, up to eight thousand people in it. So you can imagine there's a lot of variation in your in your experiences among those eight thousand people. And there's other problems too, which are common pointed out, these geographic problems. For example, the checkerboard problem or the modifiable real unit problem. I have a picture here of the checkerboard problem, which is just to say, since this is aspatial, if you rearranged units on this map, the level of isolation or the level of exposure would change, would stay the same. The one on the left and the one on the right both have an exposure of point of point two, but we can look at that and intuitively say it doesn't look like they're capturing the same measure of segregation. So we want to take account of these sort of spatial differences when we when we construct our when we construct our measure. The modifiable real unit problem simply means that the way you draw these lines on the map may affect the inferences you're trying to make. So you want to avoid having to rely on a real units that have these lines drawn. Okay, so what we do then is we construct a measure of spatial exposure where we use the individual location to construct these in inverse distance weights on neighbors to any of their K nearest neighbors. We're gonna measure these up to a thousand neighbors. And that allows us to compute weighted measures of exposure that the scholars Reardon and O'Sullivan, the sociologist, came up with a long time ago. And sociologists have often wanted to use but have not been able to because they didn't have the type of individual level data that we're harnessing here. So essentially what this is gonna ask is if we take these individuals and we weight them, we're gonna ask the same question about what would be your average exposure of somebody um, in let's say group Y with their K neighbors accounting for the distance of all these individuals in that group from them. The opposite of that would be the spatial isolation. So how do we go, how do we go about doing this? And I'll give you some more details as I go through here. We take the exact residential address of every voter in the United States and their um, registered partisanship using these voter files that we collected from the um, voter file vendor L2. So a lot of you, the political scientists that are on board might be familiar with this, but what we have is we have the actual name and the actual exact location and the party registration if they have it and the race of the individual either because they, um, they, they reported that when they signed up to vote in some states or because it's been imputed um, using other characteristics of the, using other characteristics of the voter. Um, there's a lot of uh, vendors of this data out there and I'll be happy to talk about the differences between some of them. The work we're doing now is using the target smart vendor um, that was better for our purposes for various reasons now. We take that data and we use those exact addresses to measure the, res the distance from every voter to their thousand nearest neighbors. So since we have 180 million voters, that's every voter in the United States, you can imagine that's a lot of data computation. And so what do we do to measure those distances? What we do is we use something called a geohash technique where these latitudes and longitudes that normally be used to measure these distances between people, they're measured as strings rather than the locations. And we can efficiently measure this distance and get this of those 180 million times a thousand different people. The way this works is that when you have these um, when you have these longer shared prefixes between two geo hashes, it makes it the computer can tell you that these things are a lot closer together, and it makes these indices that we process in post GIS a lot more efficient. And so we end up with this um, 180 billion distance relationships um, that we calculated using post GIS, and we ran that all on AWS for a couple of weeks and ended up with all of those. 
The way we decided to measure the distance between um, up to a thousand neighbors and not some other measure is we ran these on a subset originally um, of up to 50,000 neighbors and discovered that we didn't have a lot of variation after we got past a thousand neighbors so that we left it at that and moved forward with that for the entire country. And so with that leftover data, we of course can measure these with anything at a smaller distance from or a smaller number of neighbors than a thousand, but we'd have to recalculate it to go up further than that. Okay. So to show you why this matters, we can pick out certain locations and look at these. And these are two, it doesn't matter for all voters whether you use spatial or aspatial measures, but for some it really does. And here's an example of a couple that it does. So for example, this is a voter on the left here in suburban Milwaukee. And we can see the voter of interest here is this voter is a Republican. And that's where you see them there in this red house here in the center. And if we just have exposure that's unweighted, the, un, the non-spatial exposure, their exposure to Democrats would be about 0.36. But if you look at that map, you'll see that Republicans tend to be clustered along the lakeshore, perhaps because of income or the place they want to live or something. We can talk more about that later. But once you take a, a account of that clustering, the spatial exposure of Republicans to Democrats, that particular Republican to Democrats, goes down to 0.15. So there's a substantial decrease in their probability of being exposed to Democrats in their residential environment. Another example in a very different place is this uh, other situation here, which is rural southeastern Kansas. So this map, I should note, is on a very different scale down here in the southeast. And this time we're dealing with a Democrat in a heavily Republican area. So if we don't account for space, about 64% of their interactions as Democrats' interactions would be, with, be, would be with Republicans. But one thing you'll notice, and this is an interesting feature of partisan geography in general, is these Democrats tend to be clustered close together into little tiny pockets of Democrats spread out in these little town centers throughout Southeast Kansas. And this lonely Democrat out here in the middle of the graph is very far away from all of them. So in fact, this Democrat's exposure to Republicans is gonna be 0.98 once you take account of that, spatial, of that spatial distance because these Democrats are isolated and further away. So we can see for some voters, this sort of clustering and taking account of that really makes a substantial difference in how we measure spatial exposure to other, to other partisans. All right, let's see. No questions yet, so I'll assume everybody's still with me, but I'll get to a complication here that's important, which is, as many of you know, um, not everyone's registered as a Republican or a Democrat. So in some states, you're not allowed to register with a party. And of course, many people in party registration states um, choose not to register with a party. Now we think that leaving that all on the table, um, not trying to find out if these people have a partisanship that they would register with if they could, or if they're forced to perhaps, um, that that leaves a lot of information that is um, important to understand one's actual political environment. Because something we know from a lot of political science research is that individuals that don't register with party often act like partisans and carry the same ideology as partisans and many other things. So what we do is we impute the partisanship for those without party registration. And we end up imputing a lot of people. So you can think about what that does to what to the inferences we're trying to make here. And I'll show you exactly what we how we go about doing that. So some of it's kind of straightforward. If a voter voted in a, in a partisan primary, so if a voter is not registered as a party, but they went a partisan, but they went and voted in, let's say, the Democratic primary for presidency, then we assume that they're a member of the party that they voted in. For parties, for minor parties, I have a clear, clear ideological lean. This is not many voters, but for voters that, for example, belong to the Green Party, and we know that they're closer to the Democrats and Republicans, we assign the people to that party that they're closest to ideologically. So for everyone else, what we do is we weight the exposure measures by probabilities that we use to, um, by imputing party using these priors that we construct from, dem from demographics and geography. So this is essentially a two-step process. As one is we take we take a prior from race, gender, and age, which we can observe on the voter file, and we estimate their probability of having those conditional on party from, uh, the, from data from a, from a large national survey. And then we take a second prior from presidential vote distribution of the non-aligned voters in the precinct, where we essentially, we look at how many non-aligned voters must have voted or what the probability of non-aligned voters was voting for the Republican party. And for example, saying that is their probability that they're Republican. And then we divide, derive a posterior from those using Bayes formula and ultimately weight everything by those posteriors. 
What that does is it gives us some imputations that we weight by, and that's how it goes in our calculation. I'll show you that in a second. But for example, we could, we could take these imputations and assign them to a discrete category, depending on whatever is the highest probability that we have, either Democrat, Republican, or nonpartisan, and look at how that shakes out to see if we think we're doing a good job. That's one way we check to see if we're doing a good job. What this will show you is how many, what percent of, of these groups and what the increase in these groups or decrease in these groups is for nonpartisans for each change, each step in our imputation process. And what we find out in the end is we, we take about 80, if we do it this way, we take about 89% of the people that are nonpartisan and declare them to be partisans. One way to think about whether that seems like a big or a small number to you is actually this is really similar to the estimates that we see in survey data of how many people that say they're independents actually behave like partisans. We actually feel pretty good about that number. In fact, it's almost exactly that number. Take that for what you will. The other thing we did is we went out and did a survey of people. So we surveyed people off the voter list to see if we thought our imputations were doing a good job. And our self and self-reported party ID it agrees about 77% of the time with the imputed categories, which we feel actually pretty good about given things like, uh, given things like survey error, we think we're doing a pretty good job. Also importantly, is we, we look at the ideology of, impu of imputed voters and non-imputed voters and we compare those and we find that they're nearly identical. There's very little difference between the people we do impute and the people we don't impute. And that's both in states with and without recorded party ID. So we think our imputation is capturing something real and we're happy to have it in there. Okay, so we don't have to dwell on this, but I just wanna note one thing here is this ultimately we put that all together and, met and get this measure of spatial exposure. One important decision we have to make is this A exponent here, which is how much weight we're gonna give to proximity. And we set that to one. Um, throughout the paper that we actually published in the supporting information and such, we look at how we would change that. And for example, making that a higher exponent would give more weight to proximity and would probably even ramp up the amount of spatial isolation we set, but we set that to one as a first cut. Okay, um, I wanna go down. Okay, so what do we see after we do all that? So I'm gonna show you a series of plots that, that look like this, which is the spatial exposure of every voter in the United States. Then I'll break it down into some other places. So what we have here is we have exposure here. So this is the amount of exposure that Democrats have to Republicans or the amount of exposure that Republicans have to Democrats. The red is Republican exposure to Democrats. The blue is Democratic exposure to Republicans. The down here is isolation. So this is a Democrat's exposure to themselves. This is how isolated Democrats are just around other Democrats, that's in blue. And this is how isolated Republicans are around other Republicans, that's in red. What we see here is the solid lines are the means of those distributions and the dotted lines are the, are the dots, are the dotted lines are the dots. Dotted lines are the medians of those distributions. So a couple of things to, a couple of things to note about this. One is that on average, Democrats are more isolated than Republicans. Um, and in, and this, these levels of isolation, these average levels, one might describe as pretty low, depending on how you want to look at things. One of the things that we found most surprising about this, um, you can think about whether you'd find this surprising or not, but is just how isolated a large portion of Democrats are. So you'll see that the peak of this distribution for Democrats is approaching essentially no exposure to Republicans. So this would be where about five or less out of every 100 interactions they have in their local residential environment is gonna be with Republicans. So we see that on average, Democrats are very, very isolated in the United States and your sort of modal Democrat, the peak of the distribution is extremely isolated. Okay, so one thing you might be asking is all these different things we did to get there. What is that, how does that affect the inferences we're making? So one thing I wanna show you is the difference in um, these distributions if we have this imputation or we don't have this imputation. And you can see that in many ways, the shapes here of exposure are very similar, but the isolation would change quite a bit because when we do not, when we include independence, this is this figure on my right, when we include independence, the level of isolation is gonna go down because we've turned a lot of those independents into, into partisans in that case, and people are becoming more isolated around people like them. The other thing we, we might wanna look at is this difference between spatial and aspatial uh, uh, measures. I claim that this was this important thing we did and we can compare these differences in the distribution. If we do not account for space, how different does partisan isolation look? So here on my left, we have a spatial exposure and on the right, we have, we have the aspatial exposure where we don't weight by distance. And we can, see that the, we can see that these distributions look quite different actually, in fact, especially for Republicans. 
down here in the bottom. So keep in mind that some people can be, can their exposure can be, their level of exposure or isolation can be overcounted. For some people, it can be undercounted. And so what we look at is an absolute percent difference in spatial versus aspatial measures of segregation. And we'll see that on average, these are these solid lines here, the dotted lines are the medians. On average, the level of um, spatial, uh, the, lab, the, the an average, the percent difference in change is pretty large, it's more than 25%. Of course, a big portion of that is accounted for by this large tail out here, but you'll see that even for the median uh, voter in the United States, you're gonna be under or over counting segregation by about 20 percentage points if you don't take account of this, or 20%, I should say, if you don't take account of the spatial uh, nature of the, of the spatial distribution of voters. Just to show you what some of this looks like, um, if you want much prettier maps, you can go look at the, what the New York Times published now, but I can put some numbers around these so you can see them and look at the ones we made. So I wanna give you a sense of what this type of, what the, what, um, for example, uh, being 65% isolated looks like for Democrats. So this is Milwaukee, which is one of the more segregated cities in the United States between partisans. So this is a city that's 54% Democrat in the metropolitan area, not just the city itself, but the metropolitan area, has about 1.5 million people and Democrats are isolated at 0.65. And you can see this rather stark segregation that's visible, that's visible on the map. We can look at other places, for example, New York, which is even more isolated. Um, we're very familiar with the spatial patterns there and you can see that revealed with these large blue clusters in the middle. Now we might sort of imagine, we know what these cities look like. You know, it's not surprising that Democrats are very isolated in New York. So I think what's even more interesting is to look at some other cities where we might be less familiar with the spatial patterns. So for example, here's Pittsburgh, which also actually um, does not have a majority Democrat, at least among registered voters. And the level of isolation is still pretty high. And again, we see this large blue cluster in the middle and it gives you a sense of what 65% isolation would look like for, for Democrats. Other cities I think are even more, other cities I think are even more interesting. Sorry, my, I'm skipping ahead here somehow. And now my Adobe just is, I apologize everyone. My Adobe, my uh, Acrobat has decided it needs to work here for a second. Okay, there we go. As a preview of what I was gonna to get to, here we go. Okay, let's hope it stays there for a second. Um, I hope I didn't press the button trying to get it to move too many times. This is Oklahoma City. So we can think this is in a red state and a place that's actually a pretty red city when you think about the metropolitan area, less than one out of every four voters there are Democrats, which is unusual for a large metropolitan area. But still, you can see this positive level of Democratic cluster in there and these Democrats being more isolated in the center of the city. So we can see even in these cities in red states, we see this sort of positive isolation there. Um, if you really like these types of maps, I have them for every metropolitan area on my website, or like I said, you can go see some of the bigger ones on in what the New York Times published a while back. And you can pick out the smaller ones though too, if you want to see what isolation might look like in like, let's say you're a small hometown or something like that. These are just some examples. One thing we can see though, is I mentioned how we see this sort of consistency across many different cities where you have this isolation of Democrats in the centers of cities. We can look at how this might change. We can look at how um, the level of exposure and isolation change across different types of places. So what we did here is we divided up um, we divided up places where people could live into major, minor, uh, major and minor me metropolitan areas, and then outside of metropolitan areas. So a major metropolitan area is a metropolitan area with over a million people, and a minor one is under a million people. And then outside of a metro area is outside of what the census defines as a metropolitan area. So these would be small counties that are away from larger cities. And then we divided them up into high, medium, low, and very low density using measures of census tract density that um, were uh, invented by the people over at City Lab, um, which is Richard Florida's organization. Um, so, so just to give some intuition here, one thing I want to emphasize is, for example, a high density place, this is especially important for the for audience in New York City, a high density place is not um, Manhattan. Of course, Manhattan is a high density place, but it's to say that is a very extreme example of this. So for example, high density place in a major metropolitan area would be more like, let's say, the center of Columbus, Ohio. That'd be an example of a high density place in a major metro area. Places like Boston and New York are way out on that density measure in a way that other places are not. So what we see here is we see that even in minor metro areas and in major metro areas, these high density places, Democrats are extremely segregated. Now, of course, that starts to decrease with density 
But it isn't, it's not until we get out to these very low density places, which are essentially what I think a lot of us would think of as almost purely rural, is, the only, is when we start to see Republicans start to look like Democrats, where they're the ones living with these very high levels of isolation. One thing that's particularly interesting about this, since we have this individual level data, is we can ask, for example, what does segregation look like when we look within individual units, when we look within geographic units? And one thing we might want to understand, if we really want to understand the level of separation between Democrats and Republicans, is we might want to ask, are Democrats and Republicans actually separated if we look, for example, within the same city or within the same neighborhood? Do Democrats and Republicans separate from each other within those units? And we can do that. So what we do is we, we create a measure we call relative exposure. And we think this is an interesting measure because we think it actually captures how much separation or how much clustering there is beyond what we might expect. So for example, as you might've been thinking when I was showing you those maps, it's not that interesting. For example, if a city that is 70% 70 Demo 70 Democrat, the Democrats are 70% isolated. But we could ask ourselves if we went within that city is it the case that Republicans also have 70% exposure to Democrats? Are they more, have more exposure to Republicans? So what we do is we look within geographic unit and we ask ourselves, if we look at the level of exposure for Democrats and we subtract off how much the level of exposure for Republicans, that gives us this relative exposure. So if it's negative, that means that a, that a Democrat, for Democrats in this case, are more likely to be exposed to Democrats than Republicans are within that geographic unit and vice versa for Republicans. And so you can see, we go from large geographic units to smaller geographic units, um, moving from the top to the bottom. Democrats are on the left and blue, Republicans are on the right. And as we go down from states, it's at the state level, as you probably know intuitively, Democrats are much more likely uh, have um, that this level of relative exposure is high. The Democrats are much more likely to live around Democrats and Republicans. But we still see this at increasingly small levels. We see this at the metropolitan uh, area level, the CBSA. We see it at the county level. And then when we get down to these smaller levels, this is where this becomes very interesting to me. So within a city or a town, a census designated place, essentially, we still see negative relative exposure, saying that even within the same city and town, that Democrats are more likely to live next to Democrats than Republicans are to live next to Democrats and vice versa. Even within a zip code, which is a very small unit in many cases, we still see this negative relative exposure where Democrats are more likely to live next to Democrats than Republicans are to live next to Democrats, even within the same zip code. And then getting down to the census tract, which is the unit that a lot of um, so social scientists use to represent a neighborhood. So looking within the neighborhood, as social scientists would call it, we still see this negative relative exposure where even within these, even within these neighborhoods, Republicans and Democrats tend to separate from each other. Some of this is due to people living in the same household and we can look at that. Um, and so when, but when, even when we subtract that off, there's still some measure, uh, there's still some uh, negative relative exposure left over where people are seen to be separating for some reason by party. And we can talk more about what that reason might be at the end. Another question that people have about this a lot, my PDF skipped again. So let me see if I can get back up here. I think there's a lot of data on these last uh, on these last maps, so they take us. They tend to make my Adobe go a little crazy. Here we go. This is what I'm looking for. So a question people have a lot is how much of this is because of race, and of course, race drives a lot of this partisan segregation because we know that the part that racial groups in the United States are unevenly distributed across parties, and it could be that if people just um, all of this is driven just by racial segregation, you would end up with a substantial amount of partisan segregation as it is. One thing that's interesting, of course, is because we can observe the race of individuals, we can do a lot of things to check on this. And one thing we can do, for example, is look at how much segregation is left over if we subtract off just the within group segregation. So we take the overall segre partisan segregation, and then we look at the segregation, for example, only among white people and subtract that off from the to see how much of that is due to just segregation among whites, for example. And what we see is when we do this, when we look only within racial group, this is for whites here, that these distributions are centered around zero, meaning that there's still that there's really not that much of a difference between the segregation that's left over when we subtract off the segregation that's just among white people. We see that the, we see that um, a we see that there's substantial segregation still left um, left after doing that. Okay, so 
so what I showed you here was these over the I showed you all this all the work we got we did to get here, and I showed you some basic summaries of segregation across the United States and how we claim that it's pretty high for Democrat for among um, especially among Democrats, and it seems to be pretty high across a lot of different areas. And a lot of this, um, and that uh, we can even see it, and I think in many ways this is some of the most interesting and most interesting part about it is even getting down to these small geographic levels. We can still see um, we can still see Democrats and Republicans separated from each other. One thing that is several things that are left over after we've done this is to ask things like what what are the um, how has this changed over time? And I'll show you some evidence for that in a second. And then what are the causes and the effects of this? What causes this segregation? And what are the effects of it? And this is something that we're really trying to explore. Um, and we have a little bit, and we have a little bit of evidence for um, that's very impressionistic now that I'll show you, and we can talk about what about what you make of that, um, and then we can have a more general discussion because I think we'll have several minutes left. Okay, so so first about changes over time. So this is work we've just started to do. So you don't, if you like those other graphs, you don't get quite as pretty of graphs here. But one thing we can do is we, I say I told you briefly that we switched data vendors because we took advantage of Target Smart that provide as another data vendor of voter files that provided us with data going back to 2012. And so what we can do is we can take in, we can take these voter files going back from 2012 to 2000 and look at them all the way up to 2020 and see how these indices of segregation have changed over time. One thing I should mention is when we're doing this now, we're only looking in within party registration states. And the reason we're doing that is it turns out one of the more complicated things for us to do is actually this partisan imputation. We're working on that right now to extend that back and forth over time. I shouldn't say it's that complicated, just all the data matching takes a long time because this data can be, we have to match, uh, we have to match election results with the individual voter files. And since these come from a lot of different sources, it's just a big matching problem that we have to do a lot of cleaning and various things on. So we're working on that. Um, but what we do is we, when we rely just on the, on the states where we can observe the party registration. So you can think about that as you're looking at this, we're dropping a lot of people out. We can look and see how, how, how um, the amount of exposure has changed over time. That's what you have here is you have exposure of Democrats to other Democrats. And then this would be Republican exposure to Democrats. And these different colors represent different represent um, different years, going from red in 2012, if you just want to focus on two years, and blue in 2020. If you look over here on the left among Democrats, you'll see this red down here was the was the extremity of segregation. Those were people that were almost in, in this peak of being very segregated in 2012. You can look and see how that distribution has has the peak of that distribution, I should say, has moved further up. Um, coming to 2020. So that extreme segregation has increased between 2012 and 2020. And of course, what goes along with that is people over here in the middle, the people that are more mixed by partisanship, those types of those, the people that are in that situation have become a smaller part of the distribution. So we, just, we see this increase among Democrats of extremity of segregation. And we see a similar pattern but reversed because we're measuring exposure to Democrats here among Republicans as here on the right. And so you can see these Republicans that have very little exposure to Democrats, again, going from the red in 2012 to this blue and green color in the more recent years, that they, that, that part of the distribution has increased, this peak of extremity has increased. And so even looking over a, a fairly short period, we see this change in the level of segregation. We see these changes in the extremity of segregation, where it's becoming more segregated, um, more, more and more people are living in these very isolated places. Some of our early attempts, and I, I apologize for the y-axis on this graph, that's pretty messy. But one, some of the early attempts we've done with this is to try to separate these into different types of places to see if we can see this across different places, these changes. And so, for example, this again is just um, exposure to, to Democrats um, uh, for all voters in this case. And this is in very rural places, very urban places. And suburban places. This is measured by those levels of density that I showed you earlier. So this would be people in very dense places. These would be people in the very low density places, and these would be people in the two middle categories. So that's how we're defining it in this case. And then going from 2012 to 2020, depending on color. And as you might have guessed, based on where Democrats live, we see this um, more and more Democrats, even within the urban areas, starting to live in more and more isolated places. So even within thinking about it within urban places, they're becoming more and more Democratic. And then these rural places, the average exposure of a person living in a rural place has gotten more and more um, 
has become less and less Democrat. So the extreme low end of that has become more and more in the rural places. In the suburban places, you can look at that a little bit and, and see um, what you make of this, but you'll notice this is closer to the center of the distribution. Um, has start, you see people in the center of the distribution has started to drop as well. So in the suburban places, we see that people are moving to the extremes of the distribution as well as indicated by that drop in the center. Okay, let me show you a few other things here. So one thing to note about this, this is just the, this is just the figure I showed you at the beginning, is that since we have this individual level data, I don't know why there's an equal sign in there, I apologize, we can decompose these changes. So one thing we're doing is we're looking at individuals and we're seeing how much of these changes are due to people moving from place to place across metro, metropolitan areas or across counties or whatever you want to think of. How much of this is due to people switching their party allegiance? As I mentioned, Jacob has been working on that and there's evidence that people switch their party allegiance depending on who lives around them. And then changes to the electorate, people entering the electorate, people dying, things like that. And we're trying to decompose those, those measures to understand how much of these changes we see are, are due to that type of thing. A question that the next question often comes of this is why do we so even putting aside the changes over time, why do we see the levels that we currently do. As I mentioned, we can look at this and try to isolate the way race and we see that this really can't be explained entirely by race, but of course a portion of it can. And I just want to give you some examples of that In closing here I'm going to show you a lot of different figures. Um, and, and you can make it what you will, but this is how we're trying to think about where this type of segregation comes from. So for example, this is Birmingham, Alabama. This is in um, Jefferson County, which is the Birmingham metro area there. And we can see, for example, um, I've, I've highlighted the census tracts here. And in this map, we're looking at the red dots representing Republicans and the blue dots representing Democrats. These are based on our partisan imputation. So you'll notice that some people are kind of purple in there as well. What you'll see is if you could look at the at the distribution of race here as well, you'd see how much of this is driven by race. So for example, this census tract up here, 4902, is almost entirely African-American. And then these census tracts down here, for example, 107.01 is almost entirely white. And when you look at that, you can understand how, especially in these southern states, race is driving a lot of the a lot of the partisan segregation we see. But that's not all of it. And so when you look at other places, you can really see some other things that jump out. So this is another um, this is another part of this is another census tract in Birmingham, and this is an interesting place because this census tract one two one nine point one one sorry my Adobe's updating again is What I was about to say is that census tract is almost entirely white. It actually it is um, entirely white, which makes it an interesting place to look at. It's 100% um, white. The African American population is zero in this census tract, and yet we still see um, separation between Republicans and Democrats. This is a single census tract here. You can see just visually, you can see this how much more clustered the Republicans are up here than the Democrats down here. The relative segregation measure in here is something like negative 0.3, meaning that the Republicans are 30% more likely to be around each other than they are around the Democrats. And there'd be something similar for Democrats. What a lot of this is explained at by, if you open this up in Google Maps, for example, and you can kind of even see it if you look at these road networks here, of course, is housing. So looking at that, you'll see that you could see that these are large houses up here um, in these sort of less, more, less densely clustered streets. And that kind of intuitively fits our picture of where the parties live, the Republicans living up here in less dense places. And so we see that housing perhaps explains part of this. I don't think it explains all of it though. And I'll give you two reasons for that. Those are my next couple of slides. So one is we can see this even in places where it just doesn't intuitively fit our picture of why housing would explain all of it. Now, you can think about what you make of this, but this is the center part or part of um, the northern Los Angeles basin is the way I would put this. So this is Beverly Hills, which is a separate municipality from Los Angeles. And this is West Hollywood, which is also a separate municipality as part of the county. And as you might imagine, when you get into Beverly Hills, then the pr proportion of Republicans goes way up, which was probably just correlated with income. But here's one reason this is interesting. Is this over here in, uh, West, in West Hollywood, for example, this census tract is outside of Beverly Hills and is in the West Hollywood area. The median house price in this census tract in West Hollywood is approaching $2 million. So these are not poor people over here. Yet just crossing over that municipal boundary from, Beverly, from 
Beverly Hills to West Hollywood, we see a we see a dramatic change in the density of Democrats. So housing preferences, just housing value could explain part of it, but perhaps there's other kinds of preferences for where people want to live, the type of people they want to live around, and things like that, which are left over after we take account of things, after we take account of things like income. Another reason, I think this is a slide that keeps giving me trouble. Let's see if it comes, if we can get it to come up here. And I'll, if not, I'll just, I'll just, yeah. I think I had just allowed too many points in that map on, on the thing, next thing I'm about to show you. But what, I'll, what I was about to show you was just looking at, um, what I was about to show you was just to look at how much, um, ex how mu the amount of unexpected segregation we might have is one way is one way to put this. The amount of segregation that's that we can see when we already count here it is. So this is the democratic isolation here, and this is the percent Democrat down at the bottom. So this is just another way of thinking about excess segregations. Because as I mentioned, for example, a place that is 50% Democrat, it wouldn't surprise us if that place has 50% Democratic isolation. Each one of these little points is a central is tracked. They're all labeled. And so they look kind of messy. This 45 degree line would be a perfect, this orange one would be a perfect correspondence between the percent Democrat and the percent of isolation, which again would be not surprising, which would sort of show you that there's not much actual clustering going on. But what you could see if you, if you stared at this long enough is you could see that every tract, almost every tract in the United States, over 98% of them actually have some sort of positive segregation where there is a level of isolation that exceeds the percent Democrat. So this is something that you see almost everywhere in the United States. Almost every tract in the United States has some kind of segregation by partisanship. And this even when we, when we take out people that live in the same household, there is still leftover segregation that we can't really just explain by people that live in the same household. And so what that leaves for me is a real mystery to think about where that comes from. I don't think we can explain that all with housing. I don't think we can explain that all with race. And I think a lot of it has to be a combination, of course, of those two things, but some kind of preference that may work around the edges and cause people to, uh, to even if it's not explicitly about partisanship, that might cause people to cluster with the people around them, that are people that are similar to them on different dimensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more slide, then I'll look forward to having a conversation about whatever people want to talk about. One last question that, of course, comes up, or what are the consequences of this? And there's a lot of stuff in related literatures that we could point to and say, what do we know about when groups are segregated? And I think one of the real remaining questions is, do, do what we know about, does what we know about groups that are segregated um, when it comes to things like race or religion and things like that, does it apply to partisanship? And I don't think we know the answer to that. And I want to be really clear about that because I think it kind of gets lost when the media has talked about this and things like that, is we don't actually know if there's dire consequences of this. It's, it's really not clear, but we can make inferences from what we already know about racial segregation and other things to say there's a potential that is a bad situation. And we just have to ask ourselves what we understand about partisanship to decide whether that's true. Here's one way to look at that. You can think of this as sort of the glass half full approach to this maybe, which is to look at the level of um, isolation down here. So this is the Republican isolation. So places that are more isolated are places that are approaching one where almost Republicans are almost only around other Republicans. This is at the county level. And over here, it are, over here are places where Republicans are very not isolated, where they tend to be around other Democrats. They tend to be around Democrats, for example. And what we see here is the deviation from the expected GOP vote. This is in 2016. So there's just a quick way of looking at this that I think is interesting. So this would be the absolute deviation. And this would mean um, excess or under votes depending on registration. So if we have a place that is, for example, 50% Republican and it got 60% vote for Donald Trump, that'd be excess votes. And, the, and if they got 40%, that'd be under votes. And so the closer we get to zero means that essentially every Republican probably voted for the Republican candidate. And one thing you'll notice is that as places become more and more isolated, the deviation from what we'd expect gets smaller and smaller. So one way to think about this, and we have no causal evidence for this at all, but one way to think about this, what it could be, this would be something we might want to explore, is that cross-party communication and influence is actually happening more in these less isolated places that you might look around if you're a Republican and say, hey, who should I vote for? And then you realize that people around you are voting for somebody besides a Republican. We can tell a similar story for Democrats, or there might be that you have an explicit conversation with them and they change your mind. And that can lead to the sort of changes that we may believe is good, where people are making informed choices about who they're going to vote for because of that kind of cross-party fertilization.
We don't know if that's actually what's going on, but there's observational evidence that, that, that it would be consistent with that type of story and I think deserves further exploration. Okay, so all that being said, thank you for listening to me and seeing my uh, slide skip. Nobody asked me a question during that talk, so I hope some people have some questions they wanna ask afterwards. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing now and look forward to hearing from anybody that has a question. Thanks so much. Um, I have a couple questions, but if people have questions, you can either raise your hand um, or type in the Q&A. Uh, but I'll kick it off. I have two questions. One of them is sort of low level and nitty, and one of them is high level. Um, so the nitty question first. Um, there, so there's these examples of, of neighborhoods that are you know, almost 100% white, but have partisan segregation. Do you, are you able to check whether those neighborhoods are, you know, the, the Democrat part of them is historically black and has been sort of gentrified so that it's currently white, but, you know, there, there's a historical, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have not, but that's a really interesting suggestion. So um, we could check on that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, so one of the, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that as I'm saying it, and I think it's a really good suggestion. That one, one of the issues, of course, is, um, is racial data historically is not available, at least recently historically. And the last, uh, you know, if we go way back in the census, we can see it and I have other work using old censuses, but using um, is, uh, is only available in those larger geographic units. So for example, we could look within a census tract and say this block, we could look at the race there, but we couldn't go down to like a, a, a sub block level. But I think that's really interesting to see the historic legacies of race and how that has been repeated in patterns of segregation. It's a really interesting suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, my second question is high level, you know, so have we, have we learned more about political behavior of partisans or have we learned more about political parties and who they target and how they, you know, and their tactics for targeting? Like if we find that, right. Yeah. I think yeah. You, you mean, you mean from what we did here? Right. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, hmm. Yeah. Cause I mean, both those things, um, are conver could be converging in a certain way, right? And, right? and and there becomes a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, one, one thing we know, um, well, I shouldn't say that either. I don't know, that, it, that's, a, that's a good question. And I, and, I, and I don't know the answer to it, but I think that both those things are going on. So I, I, I appreciate that question, Aaron. And I think that um, we, 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 you know, we, we shouldn't pretend that one, necessarily one's more important than another, because of course, you know, political parties targeting people can change their behavior, right? And it can change the way who candidates listen to and such. But it seems like normatively also, that is sort of a different story than maybe when we think about partisans just changing, you know, moving away from people or changing their minds or something like that. Because the the, the latter one sounds more like how we think about other social identities like race right. and things like that. And that's what makes it seem a little more dire in some ways. And I think you're, the thing you're introducing, which is absolutely right, is that a lot of this could be due to parties and the way they behave and it's not clear that's less dire, but it's not like obviously as much so. I think people wouldn't jump to the same conclusions, which people do when you show them this research. So I think it's a good question. Uh, so Dylan Lee asks, uh, regarding that final proposition about low isolation populations following expected behavior, how might you propose studying that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, so, um, you know, so, so one thing that we should do is just get this down to lower levels. So, you know, you could do that all the way down to um, any smaller level of geography you wanted to. And we could look at that at, um, thing, we could look at things like, um, you know, at down to the census tract level or something like that. And I think that would, would bolster the proposition if we see it more at lower levels. But, um, you know, um, I, I think that, uh, Thinking about identifying the causal effect of that um, is, is is harder. Now, one thing we could think about, which would get us part of the way there, it's not like we're going to go do an experiment directly on that. Although I should say, I think that um, thinking about experimenting on the sort of behavioral manifestations of this on a low level, like thinking about how you could do those in a laboratory or something like that, are interesting. But I think we could think about using panel data, and that's the advantage of some of the panel data we're trying to collect over time to watch how places change, whether their levels of deviation change as well, for example. And so that would get us part way by enable the whole other features of geography constant, I think would, be, would, would help get us part of that direction. That's a good question. I, I have a, I have a, oh, actually, so Bennett Bernstein. Um, thanks for the informative talk today, Ryan. Beyond race and urbanicity, um, parentheses housing, has your research explored the relationship between educational attainment and partisan self-sorting? 
Uh, no, we haven't looked at education, but I and I think, but I think this is a good question, and I think there there's two there's two ways to consider this, which I um, so one is that the parties are sorting um, uh, around education, right? So it could be that all college educated educated people live in one place, and then college educated people start sorting more and more into one party, right? And that's really important to consider when you think about this, because I'll say you know again that I think that. What you see when you show people these results is that they tend to run to this conclusion that part people are sorting based on party, and it's important to emphasize that we don't really have evidence for that. I I become increasingly convinced, and I think some of that does go on, and we could talk about all the anecdotes and everything about that. But but it can't explain most of this. So part of this just could be parties sorting around those issues like education. Now, whether or not education itself is driving part is driving sorting or is correlated with sorting more. I think is an interesting question. And one thing we we know from a lot of research, and for example, Andrew Gilman has you know taught us this over the over the decades, is that it is the highly educated that tend to make a lot of decisions based on their politics, right? They're the ones, you know, they're the ones that care about politics. They're the ones that behave differently based on politics. Whether that extends to where they sort, I think is a, is an is an interesting question. One of the things that we're trying to extend is I do think that the the I think there's really good research that should make us very skeptical that people sort based purely on partisanship, but I still think it's somewhat underexplored. And I think that there's research left to be done on that. And one of the things we want to understand is if we do understand if people are moving based on partisanship itself or on things that are highly correlated with partisanship like lifestyle choice, who does that um, pertain to? And I think looking at the highly educated would be one of the first places we should look because they're of course the ones that care enough about politics and have the means to sort around politics or things that are closely related to politics. I, I have a methodological question while we're waiting for more. Um, sure. Do you have, is there a formal notion that you're using here for, you know, how different the clustering is from a rant, you know, for, from a just dropping partisans down at random. And because I know that I know that sort of like random point processes do generate clustering to some degree. Um, so, so, you know, are, are you, how are you measuring like significant clustering versus non significant clustering? Yeah. So, so that's a really good question. So, so if we really wanted to do that the right way, we'd probably look at it across um, from like a random point process. You'd be absolutely right. And thinking about how to do that on that scale would be a whole methodological problem unto itself, right? So mm -hmm. if you ever want to work on that together, we should think about that, right? Because that's you know a way to get the, the, the sort of data science end of it going together again. So the way we've done it has been much more blunt, right? Which you're, you're right to ask this question, because in some ways that's what we're trying to get at when we look at just like the deviation from a proportion, right? Where you just say, you know, like on average, if people are um, are fifty percent of a population is is Democrat, that their isolation should be fifty percent, right? But and that's going to be true on a large enough level. But when you get down to smaller levels, as you as you note, you know, a random process you can create clustering that we might see. And I think separating that on the smaller levels is an important thing to think about. But it's also a um, it's going to be a computationally a, a challenge. Yeah. Okay, um, I think there are no more questions. So let's have a virtual round of applause for for Ryan. Let's see. I don't know how you do that. There's a way uh, to do it. <laughs> but, I'll take your word for it that you're actually doing it. Yeah, everyone's applauding. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, th and thanks everybody for listening. And those of you that are out there, I say if you you know if you want to follow up on anything, I really appreciate it. And thanks for the virtual invitation. And I hope to see you all in person sometime soon. Okay, thank you. <laughs>